Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm talking to you live from the European Parliament in Strasbourg. I am meeting today with a Hungarian MEP, Katalin Szek, who is sitting on the Foreign Affairs Committee and who is also on the Subcommittee for, of Human Rights and uh, on the delegation with the United States. And I have prepared a few questions that I will now uh, ask. These are the questions that we have received from the community and I'm very excited to hear what MEP Czech has to say about them. So uh, the, fir the first question is related to the environment. We, are, uh, we know that the European Parliament has decided to reduce emissions by 2030 by 60 percent. However, member states said that this is going to be reduced to 55 percent. And this is 10% um, lower than what the United Nations gap emissions report says. And we are wondering as young people, why are we not listening to the science if all we hear is we should listen to the science, yet our emissions report is uh, indicating that we are 10% below the target? Well, you know, it's a very good question. And before I got elected, I was also marching with the Fridays for Future protest in Budapest, and I was demanding policymakers to do more. And right now, of course, I'm in the situation that I should be pushing my political community to indeed do more and listen to the science. And it is very frustrating to see that uh, even though evidence is out there, very widely available, <clears throat> I see still a lot of uh, colleagues and uh, particularly member states who are just trying to sweep the problems under the rug and uh, trying to move forward uh, with like all their dirty business uh, as if nothing would be happening out there. Having said that, I think we still have to consider all the progress we made already. And I know it's not enough, but we Europeans, we can be a bit proud of ourselves, I think, when it comes to climate change. Because we are global leaders in this area. If you look at the fifth for 55 package uh, that was presented, of course it's not enough, it's not what we wanted, but it is so much farther away uh, where we have been when this parliament got elected. I think this parliament is a driving force and we are going in the right direction, we just have to go faster. Yeah. And as I said in the beginning, the parliament has pushed for a higher goal than the member states has, have agreed upon. What can we as citizens do to help basically that the parliament's position is the one that's accepted and not the member state's position. Is there anything that you can uh, give us as an insight? Well, I think uh, all the progress that has been made already was uh, due to the push from citizens, due to the activism, due to those who marched. So I can only encourage everybody who cares about this planet to go out on the street, be vocal, raise your voice, contact your MPs, MEPs, put political pressure on the parties so that they feel that if they don't make action it will cause them votes. So your active participation matters a lot. Yeah. That's something we always say as well. I'm very glad to hear it from you as well. Um, another question is now related to your work on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, we hear a lot of uh, news always about the relationship between Russia, between China and the EU. Both are sometimes portrayed as partners, sometimes as systemic rivals. And my question would be, where do you see the future of relations with both Russia and China and the EU? Well. I think uh, it's kind of inevitable that these countries are our systemic rivals. It does not mean that uh, we don't have to trade with them. It doesn't mean that uh, we have to deny reality on many grounds. Uh, but I think we have to put human rights front and center in our relationships with Russia and China. It is completely unacceptable uh, to even consider uh, an agreement such as the Kai Agreement with China when uh, MEPs in this house, m myself included, are under sanction and when uh, Uyghurs uh, in China are uh, suffering in working camps. Uh, we have to be very assertive down the line uh, according to our priorities and also to reinforce our European sovereignty to be a stronger partner in these discourses. Mm -hmm. I just heard, by the way, a few minutes ago in the State of the Union speech that President von der Leyen uh, stated that she wants to uh, put a complete ban on the export of products uh, into the EU that have been uh, created uh, as a byproduct of uh, forced labor. So I think that's a very, very good uh, and necessary step in the right direction. We have to be forceful, assertive, and uh, not back down when it comes to our values. Yeah. 
Okay, um, thank you very much for that insightful answer. And now we move on to a topic that is related to rule of law. As you are from uh, Hungary, Hungary is often in the news because of rule of law questions and other European uh, countries, especially in the East, are often in the news as well. Where do you see the EU's role in ensuring that rule of law is actually upheld and that it's not um, broken? Hmm, and can the EU even do something to make sure that rule of law is maintained? Because we often hear from our community um, there is human rights breaches, there is attacks on uh, female rights, there is attacks on the queer community and the EU seems to be a silent bystander. The EU can and should do much more to uphold the uh, rule of law uh, within uh, the European community. And this is not only the interest of those who are living in these member states. I am very firmly committed in believing that the future of the EU is determined whether we can uh, establish and reinforce those common sets of values this community is standing for. Because this is not a Hungarian problem, this is not a Polish problem. This can be a global European problem, it can happen anywhere. And if wannabe Orbans, wannabe Kaczynski see that it is very easy to uh, just go down the East Road, silence the opposition, silence the media, redraw the laws, steal EU money, uh, and then the EU is just like standing back and the institutions are putting their hands up, the dominoes will fall. And yeah. if you want to ensure that this uh, union has a future, we have to act swiftly uh, to reinforce our values. Okay, and uh, moving on to a completely different topic okay. now, migration. So migration is one thing that is extremely close to the hearts in our community. We have unfortunately seen tens of thousands of dead people in the Mediterranean. Over 22,000 have died since um, the huge migration waves happened in 2014, 2015. And many of those deaths are also attributed partly to the EU actually, to Frontex, because we have allegations of border pushbacks. And people are saying that during the pandemic, and by people I mean um, media reports from very renowned institutions, they're saying over 40,000 people have been pushed back by um, states that are working with Frontex and that resulted in 2,000 deaths. And now my question is, looking at this massive scale of uh, deaths and misery in the Mediterranean, what can we do as citizens to change that and what is the EU doing as an institution to change that? Hmm. Well, you know, when we talk about this question, all that comes into my mind is that we had years to solve this problem. We did nothing. Uh, there is nothing such a, as a European solution for migration. And here we are at the door of an upcoming next crisis that was also attributable to our failures in Afghanistan and the failure of this entire uh, Western order or whatever, how we see it. And we still don't have anything because European member states did not manage to sort their things out and we are at the uh, gates of uh, basically a very big problem that will come crashing down on us. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, what should be done is to really try to get to a common European solution in this regard. Because like whatever we prefer, uh, whatever I prefer, you prefer, your country, my country, if it is not a joint European response, yeah. it will be chaotic, it will be uh, asymmetrical, and it will end up uh, in much more of a human suffering compared to a joint response. Yeah. When it comes to Frontex, we, I think we have to be extremely critical with our own institutions. It cannot be possible that a European uh, institution uh, violates those values that this community is standing for uh, or acting against the law, we have to scrutinize Frontex very seriously and uh, if reforms are uh, having to be made, these have to happen very, very urgently. Mm -hmm. But do you see that the EU has the capacity to bring member states together to find a common solution? Because as you said, the past seven years or six years have shown that nothing is really taking place. So we wonder, is the EU even able to bring member states together to find a common solution to migration? Well, if we are not able to agree on this, then why are we in a union? Then we could just like, you know, call ourselves a trading block and I don't know, only talk about what happens with the taxes. Uh, we have to agree. Uh, it's a complicated question. Yeah? Yes, of course, but if we cannot solve this, the union has zero future. Uh, it's, you know, the problem is that when a com uh, complicated question pops up, 
the member states and the institutions sometimes are not even interested in solving it, just trying to push the problem away so it does not cause political problems. But we have to face our challenges and uh, find a common solution. Yeah. And since this is a, a topic for the future, I want to ask you another question related to the future. We just heard the State of the Union and a lot of plans of what will take place in the next year and the years after. What do you personally see as the biggest challenge of the future in the EU? Well, I think uh, democratic backsliding is uh, certainly one of the biggest challenges our community faces. Uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges in a lot of policy areas, but I think the fundamentals of every community is the values uh, and the principle it operates on. And, and seeing that European countries do not even classify as healthy democracies, seeing the challenges uh, also at the upcoming elections uh, in France, uh, in Hungary, uh, and also a lot of other elections down the road, we are at a crossroads and we have to decide whether we will be a strong and democratic community or a weak and fragmented uh, mess uh, of the past, uh, with, uh, a, 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 an EU of the past which cannot, cannot be a player at the global stage and mm -hmm. cannot deliver for its citizens. Yeah. And to end this on a hopefully a bit more positive note, um, we are talking a lot about what's going wrong in the EU, but can you name a few things that went right over the last years? Something to inspire people and tell them that we actually need the EU and it's an important thing to have in our lives. Of course, I mean, I think the next generation EU was a huge success. Uh, Could you just explain what that is to people who don't know? Yes, it's basically a joint uh, European effort uh, to pool our European resources and help out uh, uh, each other uh, in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, it's um, a very big uh, investment into our member states, uh, partially uh, through loans, partially through grants, and there will be a lot of value created uh, uh, with uh, these these tools that is basically a joint byproduct of every every European member state. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like a historic uh, step forward. Also, I think I would say uh, that eventually our vaccination response is a huge success and we did it together. It was at a rocky start, but eventually we managed to get it through uh, together. Uh, and we in the EU are the best in the world in this regard. I would also say that uh, we are the global standard setters uh, when it comes to, for instance, privacy. And there is a lot to be done here also, but uh, for instance, the GDPR has really changed the way how we look at uh, data regulation globally. Uh, the EU has so much capacity and we are not confident enough to realize it. We did a lot of great things, but always very quiet and silent about it. I don't know how. So I really encourage you to be proud Europeans yeah. and, and, you know, try to uh, carry the, the voice of the successes we had together and of course there are challenges a lot but we are so much stronger together than divided this is what we are working on here yeah. in this house absolutely and um, as a final comment could you answer the question why do we need the EU because the word is a big uh, dangerous and uh, scary and fast moving pl uh, place uh, and if we want to face the challenges of the future, uh, climate change, migration, pandemics, uh, geopolitical struggles. We cannot go 27 ways. We have to go together one way, together with fi almost 500 million uh, people. We have so much of a stronger voice as a community than, I don't know, 10 million and 20 million and 30 million divided. Mm -hmm. We need each other. And so we have to put up also with each other because without the EU, this region really has no place in the future. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank I appreciate you. all the insights. And uh, we will make sure that we highlight all your work so people can follow more of what you're doing. And hopefully we'll speak again in the future at some point. Looking forward. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.